welcome to Furious Driving, and today I'm at the wheel of a Jag. And not just any Jag, a kind of semi-forgotten model from the Mark's illustrious history. This is a 1966 3.8 litre S-Type Jag. And it is absolutely delicious. And this car is actually currently for sale with Bidding Classics, so check the link in the description below if you want to take a closer look at it. So now, a quick word from our sponsors while you make sure you go and hit like and subscribe, and then on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and this is the original S-Type Jag, or as it is more correctly badged on the back, the 3.8S. And the 1960s were a curious time for Jaguar. While the rest of the industry was giving us a dozen different cars that looked and handled exactly the same with only a badge difference at the front, Jaguar went the other way. They built four entirely separate cars that all fulfilled roughly the same job, gave them a different name and sold them against each other for the better part of a decade. Now the S-Type though, is largely forgotten thanks to the inspector mortification of the Mark II Jag. But falling between the halo of the Mark II and the later glamour of the 420 and finally the XJ6, the S-Type, despite having a more modern version named after it in the 1990s, is perhaps a little unfairly forgotten. Let's take a look around and see what it is, because really this is the discerning 1960s Jaguar driver's choice. Now the S-Type was on sale for five years, from 1963 until 1968, and it came about because William Lyon and the Jaguar management knew that the Mark II, popular though it was, was a little dated underneath and it needed heavily updating to compete with the modern market. And in the meantime, 1961, they brought out the Mark 10 and the E-Type, which as well as having the fabulous XK straight six motor, they also had the even more fabulous IRS, the independent rear suspension, which made those cars handle like literally nothing else on the road. How good would it be, they said, to have a Mark II Jag with the independent suspension from a Mark 10? It'll be very good, is the answer. So they set about recreating the Mark II in that mould. And that meant reworking the monocoque of the Mark II to accommodate that. So instead of the live rear axle, which takes very little space under the back of the car, this has now got the full cross ladder, cross beam section of the independent rear suspension. It's effectively a double wishbone setup with a ladder in between, holding the suspension, the drive line, the brakes, the suspension, all in one separate subunit, with the drive shafts themselves acting as the upper links. This is heavier, in fact the entire car weighs 152 kilos more than a Mark II Jag and it takes a lot more space under the floor. They've strengthened the lengthwise chassis rails of the car because even though it's a monocoque there are chassis rails which add strength to that. The floor of the boot is double skinned for extra strength. Around the back you'll notice the spats have gone but everything gets this heavy eyebrow around the wheel itself. But most notably of course is the tail end entirely is significantly longer to give it like a baby Mark 10 look. This caused the whole aesthetic of the car, the balance was changed, so they had to rework the front of the Mark II as well. So we have these slightly different quad headlamps and different wings. It's very similar. At a glance, the casual observer probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a Mark II and an S-Type, certainly from a distance, but they are actually very different. Underneath the skin, though, the centre structure is broadly unchanged. The bulkhead, the dashboard, the windscreen panel, the, all these areas of substructure are the same as the Mark II Jaguar. The roof line, though, is longer and lower. At the B post, it's an entire inch, two and a half centimetres lower than the, the Mark II, and the roof line extends further back. So although it's got a lower roof, there's actually more headroom in the back of an S-Type than there is in a Mark II. But that's not really why people would buy one of these. The reason to buy one of these is because with that rear suspension and its independent front suspension as well, these things really do handle. Now, it's not a Jaguar without a Leaper. Now, this is the Leaper, the one looking straight at you, that's called the Growler. I'm not gonna make any jokes about this. This one is a 3.8 litre. This was available with both the 3.4 and the 3.8. Curiously, the Mark II Jag, the 3.4 was by far the biggest seller of the range. In the S-Type though, the 3.8 outsold the 3.4 massively. Let's have a quick look underneath the bonnet. 
Now you can tell this is a luxury car from the past because the bonnet rises up on these spring-loaded hinges and just stays there, which was a genuine luxury item back in the 60s. Now this is the magnificent XK straight six engine, which came from the XK series of sports cars, the E-Type, everything else. However, in this application, it's a twin carburetor rather than a triple carburetor as we found in the E-Type because there physically isn't the room to fit a third carburetor here in this engine bay. It's all just so tightly packed, but it is still a very beautiful arrangement. So around the back of the S-Type, we do of course have the badge, the Jaguar script 3.8S, showing us what a great thing this is. The Jaguar cast metal um, boot handle releases in here and the reverse lights slash number plate lights all in here. Inside we have got a really, really usefully big boot. One other reason why the uh, police forces love the S-Type. It's so much more luggage space for all the police equipment, as well as catching bad guys. You could chuck them in the boot as well. So we've got a ton of space, and this floor, as I say, is double skin for strength, giving more rigidity to the car's structure. Now moving around the side, you notice we have got a big rear window, slightly narrower C-post. We do have the trademark little cutout of the rear door frames which dip into the bodywork looking very very cool indeed. Little swage line detail of chrome trim and these lovely sculpted door handles which just flow out of the car with a separate button to open them. In the back we have got parts bin from somewhere, the same quarter light catches as you'll find in the front of a Rover P6. Notice the lovely chrome window frames, very very sharp edge on these things, chrome B post, more chrome everything. The door itself is a work of art. It could only really be a Jaguar, or certainly a British car of the period. All this chrome carries on wrapping around the door frame. So we have this interesting little catch for the quarter light. Push the button to open it, wind it out, and you have a bit of ventilation. Or if you're a, a pipe smoker or something, you can get this pipe smoke outside the door. The delicious real wood door cappings. These vanished in the 420 in the name of safety. It went to a, a laminate. The door cards are just beautiful. Lovely mid-century sculpted shapes for the window winder door handle with a little crease down the centre of it. And interestingly, a turnable lock for locking the door. Quite unusual. Small armrest, not move up and downable as in some of the bigger luxury cars of the day, but do have an actual metal insert. So when you pull the door handle, you're pulling on sort of smooth metal rather than squishing into the squishy stuff. Beneath it all, we've got an actual door pocket, elasticated so it tucks itself shut when you've opened it. And again, a nice metal catch to hold it. Everything feels such fine, fine quality in here. We even have a little bit of nice ribbed detailing down the length of the door card. So lots of lovely stuff getting going on there. Climbing aboard, we've got the aluminium kick plates, the tread plates as you climb in. Because although it is not actually a bench seat, it is two separate large, large armchairs. There's no space in the center for the handbrakes. The handbrake is down here on the right hand side. Climb aboard. It is a sea of wood and red leather, and it is absolutely delicious, it has to be said. It feels quite big and open. You do feel a little bit close to this massive steering wheel. Well, you can adjust that if you have two hands free. We have got, well, so despite the fact that the roof line is lower than the Mark II, there are still absolutely loads and loads of headroom. And a very attractive, kind of semi, semi shiny material up here for the headlining. And the wood is everywhere. You'll notice, apart from this delightful burr Belgian walnut uh, tea shelf we've got just here, which is a delight in itself. You'd be definitely wanting the coasters before you put a mug of tea on that, because that is just, just the best. This wood continues all around the A post, up to the top. It carries on around the front of the windscreen, on these little rails here. It's just a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. It follows down the B posts, around, it curves around the rear windows. It's just absolutely delightful. You'll notice there's even this double roll of padded leather up here before you hit the ceiling. And nice little metal uh, coat hangers up here on it as well. It feels like you're in a very expensive London hotel rather than in a car. It's absolutely wonderful. Now moving back down to the dashboard, this one is across everything. It's swathed in everything. We've got our glove box with a lockable push button to open it and a little metal catch which echoes the shape 
of the door handle on the outside, so it's not actually a complete semicircle. It's a slightly unusual aerodynamically streamlined shape. So just like the door handles outside, moving across the center, and we've got this whole band of walnut across the width of the thing below the dashboard or across the face of it. This is very much the Jaguar family look. We've got the four dials, amps, fuel, oil, water, with a switch for the lights here in the center, side light, headlight, and you notice the amp ampermeter flickering as you do that. And below that we've got this bank of other switches. It's very aircraft inspired. It's a beautiful mid-century, semi-industrial, semi-aviation inspired uh, interior design. So although this bank of switches is uncluttered by any kind of um, typography or labeling, it's all down here in this black band underneath it. So these switches are for the interior map light. Panel lights, dim and bright. Slow and fast for the fan. Ignition, obviously. Cigar lighter, not cigarettes, we're in a more expensive car than that, the starter button, fuel left and right tank because this car went from a single 14 gallon tank in the Mark II to a pair of 7 gallon tanks in the back. Slow and fast and off obviously for the wipers and the windscreen washers as well. So that's all just there underneath that again with the streamlined door handle rather than a just boring old semicircle. A lovely little sub tea shell which has got lots of room for picnic activities. Absolutely delightful. This is just oh, so so nice. That rolls back in there very smoothly indeed. Across to the right hand side in front of the driver we have got our big twin black faced dials. All these dials black faced and looking incredibly sporting like they've come straight from the track of Le Mans. We've got our rev counter on the left which red lines at five and a half thousand RPM which is pretty brisk for something that debuted in the 1940s. The whole look of the typography and the font and the white on black, it looks like it's been lifted straight from a hurricane or a spitfire. And in the bottom of that, we've got the, the car's clock is actually in the bottom of the rev counter. Over to the right of that, we do have the speedometer, which goes up to an impressive 140 miles per hour which to be honest, in a tuned car is probably not that unrealistic. Over to the right of that, we've got two more switches. This one is an interesting one, which says intermittent speed hold in and out. So it sounds like it's got some kind of cruise control, but in fact, this is an auxiliary fan, which has been added by the owner <laughs> for the cooling. And of course our brake fluid and handbrake warning light just there. Moving back ever so slightly, we have got two switches. Unusually for a car of the 60s in Britain, we've got our indicators on the left-hand side, as is now the modern way. Um, rather than on the right hand side as so many of uh, the car's brethren would have been. To the right of that we've got our Prindle shifter, all indicated on the shifter in the centre. Moving back steering column we have got our lovely gold Jaguar face growling at us from the centre of the steering wheel and that's in the centre of an absolutely vast Bakelite style smooth very thin rimmed steering wheel. Absolutely lovely and so of the time. A delight to hold. It's amazing when you look at this compared to our current generation steering wheel which is like, like that. This is not at all of that ilk. Hanging in the centre of that with this chrome half ring, this half moon which is the horn. <laughs> That's not the horn I expected. That is not an anticipated parp for a car of this nature. Okay, now underneath this whole affair, we have got another shelf, a lower tea shelf. No good for putting cups in because it's not tall enough for that, but you've got lots of room for snacks, uh, biscuits, uh, small sandwiches, afternoon tea, scones with cream, anything like that will fit under there quite happily. Pork scratchings will be absolutely perfect on there. There is lots more red leather and the red leather is divine. Lots more bits of chrome, just giving little detail touches to everything. And of course, lots more wood. We do have these rather curious knurled knob slash dials for the uh, heating and ventilation controls. And of course, a slider for hot to cold just here. Above the ventilation controls, we've got this little vent just here as well. And that is all surrounded by the radio. This is not the original radio, obviously. This is a more modern CD unit. Underneath that, we have got a little slide out ashtray below which we've got controls for air, heat and off, more ventilation controls. And finally, because this car is extremely well appointed, we'll take a moment to mention the fact the entire transmission tunnel is covered in yet more, I think it's actually vinyl rather than leather at this point, but more of this red upholstery, which has got speakers here in the side for the radio as well. We've got a control for the rear vent on and off. So if you've got rear passengers, you can send air their way if you want to. Now rolling back into the cabin itself, these seats are, wow, absolutely delicious. I thought they were leather, but the more I sit in them, the more I think they might actually be like a, a leatherette material. But they are enormous armchairs, a split bench seat, if you will, and they both have an independent armrest, so you can get yourself as comfortable as you like in here. They even have 
Jaguar seatbelt. I don't know if these are original to the car or not, being 1966 car. Now climbing in the back, there's a lovely solid mechanical feel to the door handles themselves. It's got these nice opening quarter lights, which are absolutely enormous, it has to be said. More of the same delightful wood with very evenly placed screws holding the capping in place. More of the same red door cards and the same door furniture, but we have got significant door pockets in the back. First of all, padded armrest, which is lovely. Huge door pocket and a little ashtray. I love the action on that lid, that's great. The only thing I mourn from the loss of smoking in cars is the clever actions on the lids of ashtrays. It almost makes up for the fact the car smelt absolutely terrible. Almost, but not quite. Now, climbing in, that little cutaway for the rear window does give you a little bit more extra headspace climbing aboard. So the roof line is a little bit low, but you climb in and you have got, let me spin the camera around, loads of headroom considering they've lowered the line of the roof it's incredible but extending the roof panel back beyond the back of the seat and raising the headlining to basically just being virtually in contact with the uh, the roof panel itself has meant there's a significant amount of space in here we have static seat belts here in the back we also have three interior lights this is very high luxury indeed got one here in the center of the back and we've got one on each b post this is unbelievable opulence for the 1960s looking around the, at the trimmings things are just very very high luxury indeed obviously we've got the, the red vinyl on the back of the seat but then the lower half is carpeted to protect the seats from being kicked by the occupant and the, as for the carpet itself it really is vip treatment in here this is a lovely car to be in as a driver or a passenger speaking of which let's get it on the road right so starting the jag we turn the key on push the button obviously with a foot on the brake and the car in park slide the prindle over to drive the mirrors are not the most helpful because they are little clip on things not standard and off we go oh that noise the noise from the xk is just divine oh what a thing Away we go. Oh, this thing has so much pickup. It instantly in a cops and robbers kind of movie. Got a bell on the front to get some Sweeney type action going on. Fantastic. Although this is quite a big car, it absolutely shrinks around you as soon as you're at the wheel. This car has got a later aftermarket power steering system fitted to it, although power steering was an option. I think it's a Berman system. It's a fairly hefty car, and without it, you do get really good steering feel. Same as on the Mark IIs and everything else. Um, very, very heavy indeed at low speed, but get on the move and the thing just comes alive. This, with the power steering, just makes it a little bit easier to, to drive at any speed and of course being in the automatic it's again very easy to get in the car and start going very quickly indeed it has got disc brakes all around same system as on the mark ii it was felt by the engineers that the system was good enough that despite the extra performance of the 3.8 and the extra 150 or so kilos of the car itself that they didn't really need to beef that up at all it was it was more than adequate Really, the thing that made this car so exciting and such an improvement over its predecessor was that independent rear suspension. The Mark II already had independent front suspension. The same coil sprung twin wishbone setup as the Mark II. But the rear independent suspension just made the car completely come alive. So Jaguar's range out of the 50s into the 60s was a bit of a mess. They had the Mark I initially, which was a beautiful car, great engine, slightly wayward handling as racing champion Mike Hawthorne found out to his cost on a corner on the A3, actually not that far from here. Um, in the words of the other driver, having a bit of a dice. Um, he was changing into third, I believe the other driver said, which the uh, judge, being more used to things like Morris Miners, assumed to mean about 35 miles an hour. Hawthorne was doing about 80 at the time when he left the road because these things were pretty rapid. So that evolved into the Mark II. The Mark II improved a lot on the Mark I. Favourite of cops and robbers. 
with good reason. Fast, pretty respectable handling, boot was a bit small. So that's where this came in. This was intended to improve on and replace the Mark II Jag. However, by the time it was launched, the Mark II was still selling like hotcakes. So it was decided to keep them both on sale at once. This is a, a thing we've seen a few times in motoring's history, notably with the Volvo 200 series being replaced by the 700 and then the 900 and still soldering on. So this was a big improvement over the Mark II. Much better boot space, better interior space, a more luxurious feeling cabin, and significantly better handling. The rear suspension on this was considered to be a benchmark of handling well into the 1980s, decades after it was introduced. But the styling left a lot of people cold. They preferred the more compact, better balanced looks of the Mark II. So although this was the better car, if you knew, you knew this was the one to go for. The Mark II kept on getting sales. So this was intended to be a baby Mark 10. So the intention had been all along to make the range just be two cars, the big Mark 10, and then the baby Mark 10 being the S-Type. However, they found the Mark 10 wasn't really selling that well. It just wasn't hitting the mark with buyers, particularly in America where they really wanted it to, to find a home. So they renamed the Mark 10 as the 420G and they restyled this as the 420 with a, a flatter, very Thunderbirds-y styled front end and called that the 420. And what they should have done at that point was to kill off the S-Type and the Mark II and just have the 420 and the 420G, but they didn't. They kept all four on for sale because everything was selling. So they thought, well, why not? Let's just keep on selling everything, which is a really bad business decision. So ultimately in 1968, when the uh, XJ6 finally evolved, it arrived and it was bigger than this, the S-Type and smaller than the X-Type, but it did the job of everything and it did it very well indeed. And it still had the same rear suspension as this did. So really the only thing stopping this car being an absolute sales sensation was the fact that some people just didn't like the proportions. Although it's not a bad looking car, compared to most other cars on the market, it was still very, very pretty. And coupled with the fact that it drives as well as most modern cars, better than many modern cars. I mean, I would much rather take this on a long road trip than any SUV. It really is a wonderful thing to be at the wheel of. Particularly with that glorious XK engine. I can dip my foot here now, it's automatic so it will kick down. What a sound! If it wasn't for the speed limit in a Mini Cooper, I could be doing 80 or 90 miles an hour in a matter of moments. This thing just looks and sounds and drives brilliantly. It's just a wonderful thing to be in. Now this car has one more little secret up its sleeve. You might be thinking this came out of Brown's Lane back in 1966. Well, it kind of did, but this isn't actually a British built Jaguar. This is a South African built Jaguar, a CKD or completely knocked down kit form car. What happened in the 60s and 70s, for a long time in the latter half of the 20th century, British car manufacturers would half build a car, then they would cut the roof off, create the car up in kit form, and send it out to wherever in the empire there was a factory where the car was going to be sold. And then they could reduce their shipping costs and also their import taxes on the local area. They did in Australia and America, and in particular, South Africa. BMW and Mercedes did exactly the same thing. So this car is actually a South African import car, believe it or not, having spent the first 30 years of its life somewhere on the Southern Hemisphere. It really is a fascinating way of building a car. And then in the early 1990s, it was re-imported back into the UK by its owner and then went to a complete bare metal restoration. So really fascinating history. The CKDs are a, a range of cars that's worth putting a separate video on it in themselves. Wow, these things do handle so well. It's just a shame that having come from South Africa, we've lost all the history that came with it. So it's really hard to know what happened to it, where exactly it lived. All I know is where it was built and where it was sold. But that did mean that it did spend the first 30 years of its life virtually rust free. However, if you were to take the paint off, you would see extra little welds and things where the roof had been attached in that South African factory. 
This thing is so stable. It's incredible. It feels like such a modern car. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this absolutely magnificent S-Type. It's a car that just can't fail to, to make you happy. The noise of the engine, that supple, incredible ride. And well, it's a good looking thing as well, isn't it? So if you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join us again next time driving something completely different. Mm -hmm.